This guy's a law enforcement? Yeah. We're an independent government agency who, along with the FBI and the Federal Reserve, regulate the stock market and corporate fraud. And the Federal Reserve is a prison? No, basically it's a help-for-profit bank that sets interest rates and loans money to other banks. Come on in, fellas. You gotta be kidding me. You're Urshan's lawyer. We're turning over our investigation to you? Let me assure you, there will be no conflict of interest between me and David Urshan. And if this were an actual investigation, I would immediately recuse myself. This is all the evidence we have, and I, I truly hope you take this seriously. Yes, very much so. From everything I've heard, I understand you guys are the best at these types of investigations. Uh, outside of Enron and AIG and Bernie Madoff, WorldCom. Meet Bernard J. Ebers, born on August 27, 1947, in Edmonton, Canada, to a family of traveling salesmen. Bernard was the second of five children. After high school, Ebers briefly attended the University of Alberta in Calvin College before enrolling at Mississippi College. During this time between schools, he worked as a milkman and bouncer. While attending Mississippi College, Ebers earned a basketball scholarship. An injury before his senior season prevented him from playing his final year. Bernard earned a bachelor's degree in physical education from Mississippi College in 1967. An honorary doctor of laws from Mississippi College in 1992, and also an honorary doctorate from Tungaloo College in 1998. Ebers began his career operating motels in Mississippi. He joined with several other people in 1983 as investors in the newly formed Long Distance Discount Services, Inc., and it became a public company after acquiring Advantage Companies, Inc. Soon after, it merged with another discount service provider, Advanced Telecommunications Corporation, which resulted in the name WorldCom. Ebers was chief executive of the corporation. As the new CEO of WorldCom, Bernard focused much attention on the aggressive acquisitions of other telecommunication companies. While heading the company, Ebers led WorldCom through 17 mergers. In 1996, WorldCom acquired MFC Communications, Inc. for $12 billion which at the time was one of the largest corporate acquisitions in U.S. history. However, Bernard did not stop there, and in October of 1997, WorldCom announced a bid to acquire MCI Communications. WorldCom was not alone in its attempt to acquire one of the largest telecommunication companies in MCI. British Telecommunications Corporation offered $19 billion for MCI, but Bernard Ebers was relentless in his aggressive acquisitions and countered BTC's offer with a $30 billion offer for MCI to which no company could match. The acquisition for MCI by WorldCom was finalized in September of 1998 at $35 billion, with Ebers assuming $5 billion of the MCI debt. After the mergers, Ebers received numerous accolades from the press for his role as CEO, while WorldCom quickly grew into one of the largest telecommunication companies in the world. The WorldCom acquisition train did not stop there, however, and in 1999, Ebers announced that MCI WorldCom was attempting to acquire rival company Sprint Communications for $129 billion. That fraud started in earnest after WorldCom's deal to acquire Sprint was turned away by federal regulators in the summer of 2000. With the Sprint deal being killed, it, it put us in a situation, who were you going to buy of any size? So now you had to turn into an operations company. And, and the question was posed, I think, in, in, on the street as well as internally is, is you know, how well will Bernie do as an operating CEO versus an acquisition and growth CEO? With his latest deal in shambles, Ebers faced an additional challenge in the summer of 2000, the most difficult operating environment of his career. The economy was in trouble, the telecom sector was in trouble, and WorldCom being part of that was in trouble. Certain businesses started to not be able to make their revenue targets. Um, so there was a lot more of um, customers that we were running across that had not paid their commitments to us. Of all those customers, the internet companies were in the worst shape. In 2001, we, we processed over 100 bankruptcies out of that segment alone, companies that just literally went out of business as customers of WorldCom, and in some cases left us with substantial billings. The answer? The biggest accounting fraud in the history of corporate America. They began to draw down on reserves, inflate their income when the reserves, as they must be, were ultimately exhausted. Then they undertook even more brazen efforts at restating expenses as capital expenditures, which had the effect of raising the income. 
WorldCom would make good on its earnings numbers for Wall Street by making those numbers up. If the actual numbers were used and not the cooked numbers, it would show that they missed those earning targets. In 11 out of the 13 quarters between 1998 and 2002, and in the last four of the last five quarters prior to the actual bankruptcy, they actually lost money. Senior managers at the company knew the true state of the business. What they couldn't figure out was how the numbers given investors were staying strong. The charges filed today are a result of an extensive investigation of WorldCom Incorporated. In August of 2002, the Justice Department indicted several top WorldCom executives. The charges followed the company's own admission that its profits for the previous three years were an illusion. Massive accounting fraud had made a business gone bad look good. The phony income would soon grow to more than $11 billion, the largest fraud ever committed by a U.S. corporation. We were astounded on the one hand. On the other hand, the light bulb went off. That's the answer that we didn't understand, and that was the reason that we couldn't understand. It was not only, oh my gosh, but wow, what a relief. What about anger? I, you know. I can understand relief and I can understand those emotions, but I have to believe that a part of you thinks about the thousands of employees who lost their jobs, the people you perhaps had to fire because you thought they weren't up to the task. Think of all the companies that went out of business that assumed that that was real. At WorldCom, few things were real. It was a company whose business model was built on a lie. This lie all along was orchestrated and controlled by Ebers. Prosecutors in the case successfully argued that Evers was running the show when masterminded this $11 billion fraud that toppled his company and troubled the entire telecommunications industry after. Bernard, with the assistance of WorldCom's former chief accounting officer, Scott Sullivan, chose to lie to their investors and regulators while artificially inflating their company's earnings and stock prices, while also failing to report their missed growth projections. With its rapid growth in numerous mergers, WorldCom accumulated billions in debt. With this looming debt, Evers and Sullivan turned to illegal accounting moves that misstated their revenues and actually inflated their earnings by hundreds of millions of dollars. This inevitably led to the collapse of WorldCom and the federal indictment that would soon follow. A final nail in the coffin for Bernard and the WorldCom dealt with sweetheart contracts and loans that were extended to Ebers by WorldCom's board of directors. The board extended Ebers $366 million in personal loans and loan guarantees, which he later defaulted on, and they totaled more than $400 million. This wrongdoing sparked an internal investigation two months later. In July of 2002, after accumulating $41 billion in debt, WorldCom filed for bankruptcy. After the internal investigation and cooperation from Scott Sullivan, a federal indictment was filed against Bernard Ebers in March of 2004. The charges included securities fraud, conspiracy to commit fraud, and participation in filing false corporate records with the SEC. After a widely watched eight-week trial in early 2005, Ebers was sentenced on July 13, 2005 to 25 years in federal prison for orchestrating the record $11 billion fraud. His sentence was one of the stiffest in corporate fraud cases ever at the time. Today, Bernard is serving out his sentence at Oakdale, Louisiana Federal Correction Institute after continued failed appeals of his conviction. He will remain locked up until 2027, when he would be 87 years old. It's beyond me how somebody could behave that way. I don't know how you get up and, if you're a man, and shave every morning and look at yourself in the mirror how you could live a life <clears throat> knowing the type of things that you're doing, uh, knowing that it's wrong, 